So Jonathan Dio, host of the Mindful Money Podcast. Thank you so much for joining me on Podcast Junkie. Harry, I'm excited to have this uh, conversation, actually. You're the expert. I'm just you're in it's your been own. The... <laughs> well, what's interesting is that you are the expert in your domain of expertise. And I think what's been exciting to see over the years is how podcast hosts can bring that expertise and things share things that have only been accessible either to your clients or your students or your close friends, the work that you do. And I think as we unpack your journey, you'll just, it, I want the listener to discover how much is available to you in terms of what's mm -hmm. been opening up for you from a networking perspective, even just finding your own voice perspective. And I'm sure that's been happening for you over the years. So we'll rewind the, the clock back a little bit. And I want you to share with the listener a little bit of your background in terms of, you don't need to give the whole resume, but the short version of, if you think about the milestones and the highlights that got you to where you are now, how would you summarize that? Yeah, I think there's probably three or four good points in time that to highlight. I didn't go to school. I mean, I started off in school to study finance, but I got bored of it. And so I ended up studying philosophy and comparative religion and going to grad school in literally Buddhist studies. Did that for three years. And then my first wife said, Hey, it was her turn to go to school. So I dropped out and, you know, I had a degree in philosophy and I was a dropout of a Buddhist studies program. So, you know, Wall Street, Wall Street made sense. <laughs> and I interviewed for one job at Dean Witter and they hired me. And I was a sale, cold caller sales guy for Dean Witter. And I spent five years at seven different firms. So I jumped around a little bit. There's a lot of mergers and acquisitions, that kind of stuff. Figured out I didn't like Wall Street at all. Started my own company in 2001. And 20 years later, in 2021, I merged that company into a larger firm and I sort of pivoted away from, and I still do the one-on-one -on -one stuff and I still work with advisory clients, but I'm a lot more about mindful money and about education and coaching people that haven't made their first million. Like I've worked with millionaires my entire career. Now I'm trying to help other people build that. And the service isn't really, from a financial education perspective, that service isn't really out there that much. How does one drop out of a Buddhist school is it where you caught smoke no, I, in the I, in bathrooms or, or is it just, I, I just withdrew. I needed to work full time to support my wife. And so I just, I withdrew. And it, it's an interesting question because they actually make you, for me to leave, I had to sign a document that said I wouldn't try to like re-engage and try to, I wouldn't come back a year later and change my mind. I don't know what it was. I don't remember. I don't have the document, but it was an interesting mm. exit program. Yeah. What was it about the world of finance that attracted you? Is it something you were good at? Is it a math proclivity or just I'm curious what, what pulled you towards that? I mean, I think that the way I've explained this in the past is I am, I was raised without any money. So the thing that you don't have when yeah. you grow up is kind of the thing you end up coveting or wanting or desiring or, so I had this sense that I was never stable financially as a kid. And so I wanted to make sure that I could be stable. And I thought the best place to do that would be where the money is, which is Wall Street. Yeah. And so how did that manifest it when you were younger or did you feel that as a need that there were things that you wanted to do in life or wanted to have in life and you just didn't have access to them? And that, did that create some sort of longing within you, within you or a way to make sure that you didn't feel this in the future? Yeah. Longing is a really nice way to put it. I wouldn't say longing. That's very intellectual. <laughs> so just the best example, I love playing soccer. I've played soccer my whole life and I would go to soccer practice. And all of my, literally all of my friends would have the leather Adidas. They'd have Nike didn't even have cleats then. This is pre Nike. So mm -hmm. they had this miter M I T R E was a brand that everyone had. I had plastic shoes from Payless, Payless shoe mm -hmm. source. And I was embarrassing and I was embarrassed by it. Go to an after school event as a middle schooler. Every, you know, my friend's dads came and they had suits and they had the tie on and my dad came in his overalls and his, he worked manufacturing and the car we drove had the way the doors closed in the back was there was a rope between the two doors holding them closed. So there's all kinds of things that I wanted and I couldn't have. And Hey, we can't afford that was like, that was the phrase that I heard the most often. And on weekends I would sit with my mom and go through the, the Sunday paper and we cut out the coupons that we would use when we went to the grocery shopping, wherever we went grocery shopping. And we were couponers before it was cool. <laughs> it was cause we couldn't afford it to eat otherwise. So it's, there was a lot I wanted. And I had kind of expensive taste. Like I wanted a, I wanted nice things. And so I started working when I was 12 so I could afford some of my own things and kind of went from there. Looking back and being a parent yourself, 
do you see, or do you have a different perspective in terms of what your parents must have been feeling or going through during that time? And, or have you had conversations about that to just look back at it and, and see what from a different lens? Absolutely. I spent a lot of time talking to my mom and dad about this. My dad was raised. So we had more money when I was growing up than my dad had when he was growing up and we didn't have any money. So I'll just quick story. My dad tells stories about when you're driving along in the middle of the country and you see to the side of the road, a gray wood, like one or two room shack. Paint is all worn off. There's no windows. The door is hanging off its hinges. The place my dad lived as a kid was they would basically squat in that kind of a place. And then they would use cardboard to cut the wind. Cause it, we're talking South Dakota. So it's cold and snowy yeah. and they would yeah. use cardboard to cut the wind and they would sleep with the dogs to stay warm. And so that, so I had a lot compared to what my dad had and my kids have grown up with plenty, like insane amounts of everything. And it's interesting. I think that the reason I have what I have was because I was raised with very little and I create a drive and it made me want to be successful. Maybe want to, and that's the one thing I worry about as a parent. I worry that maybe I have given them too much. My wife would say, Jonathan, you have given them too much. I've been trying to ratchet you back, but you know, she kind of understands why I do it. But yeah, that's, it's an interesting conundrum. Like how do you raise kids? How do you teach them about money? Do you hold back? Do you make them work? And we've done all that. We've made them work and we've held back and they've had chores and all that kind of stuff, but it's a tough question. Yeah. That story resonates with me as well. I'm the child of immigrants. I was actually born in El Salvador, so I came here when I was a year old, but I'm conscious of that struggle that parents go through. And we had, you know, this four siblings. We even had an older sister that passed away when I was two. So there's a lot of, I imagine, trauma going on. And I'm feeling that like what well, your story like is really resonating with me. I'm trying not to get emotional about it because I'm just putting myself back in that situation. I, I remember our parents, show, they're like, we need to buy a home because we were living in an apartment somewhere downtown. And like, we had like a little family meeting at the table and like for the next, whatever it was, six months, we're going to be eating rice and beans and tortillas. And like, they're like, this is what's going to happen because, you know, this is what we need to go to get to that next level. And, you know, I, I even think about the fact that my dad came here when he was in his early thirties. Like I could never leave this country to go to another country where I don't speak the language and I don't know anybody. And then I think about that and that's sort of what drove the question. Just kind of, even with the men's work that I'm doing now, we talk about, we see our fathers as this father figure. But when we think about they're just someone in their thirties, and if I try to transplant myself to what he was thinking and going through and feeling and struggling with and stressed out about, like I see him in a different light and I feel like all sorts of compassion for him and just see him as a child and as a boy and as a young man, as a teenager, and it really changes the dynamic and, you know, puts in, it's a lot of things into perspective. For sure. Yeah, no doubt. And there's a. An experience I had in high school, and I share this with friends, and the friends all cackle and laugh at this, but my dad, he would get really frustrated with my brother and I, and then he would literally walk into the garage, and he would open and slam the cabinets. I, we just hear this crashing and stuff falling around, and like he wouldn't hit us, but he'd go outside in the garage and like vent. <laughs> that was so funny, but yeah, yeah. I just imagine what the sense that I can't provide the life I'd like to provide for my family. How does that, and that frustration kind of builds and then it's got to go yeah. somewhere. Right. So yeah, it's better for him to do that than smack us around. So I appreciate that. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah, yeah. And so as you were moving into this new direction in your life and working in finance and then seeing that world as well, cause I, I worked in banking, I worked at JP Morgan Chase and E-Trade. So I wasn't directly in finance, worked in marketing, but I got to see, I mean, I started my first job as a bank teller. So <laughs> I got to see people like coming in and doing transactions for them. It is a weird situation because on one end, I'm a bank teller, but I'm seeing these people depositing these, at that time, it seemed like ungodly amounts of money into their account. I was like, who are these people? And like, how do they, how do you get to be someone like that? You know, and at that point, it's probably thousands or tens of thousands. And I was like, whoa, like, that's a lot of money. And so as you were progressing through this journey, I feel like there's two directions people can take when they're in finance. They'll just go for it and they just become filthy rich hedge fund managers, you know? And with so much money, they don't know what to do with. And, but it seems like you, and maybe it's because of, you know, it seems like it's because of like the original path of Buddhism and that colored how you viewed the world of finance, but also this idea of making it accessible to more people. And so was it a gradual transition for you? Or did you know when you got into finance or like, and you see that world from the inside, 
that maybe this is not all it's cut out to be. I learned like one lesson at every firm I worked and I got to, I could go off, I could go hours on these kinds of things. And there's so many funny stories about, not funny, like horrible stories. Just one quick story. There's a guy that I worked with, the first company I worked for at Dean Witter. He was the golden boy of the San Francisco office. He basically stole a bunch of data from Bank of America when he worked there and he moved to Dean Witter and it became Dean, Morgan Stanley Dean Witter very quickly. And he took that information, which is basically maturing CDs at B of A and cold called and into these people and then told them we had CDs, their broker sold CDs. And he brought their CD money over to Morgan Stanley Dean Witter. And I remember coming in on a Saturday because I, I work 15 hours a day, six days a week. And I come in on a Saturday, one Saturday, and he never was there ever. Like he was never there. I came in one Saturday and he was there. All the managers were there. Everyone was there. And they're all shredding a bunch of documents. <laughs> Not a good sign. <laughs> and I was like, this is juicy and I don't want to be here for this. I don't know what's going on. This is crazy. And what turned out is he was repapering all kinds of accounts, right? He had claimed that the, all his clients were like of a certain risk tolerance and that didn't match the way they were invested. And so he had to redo a bunch of stuff and didn't get signature. It was a big night. And this is the kind of stuff that you run into all the time. There's a guy sat next to me. He had a colorful shirt, always with white cuffs and white collars with, and he would come in and do his G ster. He'd do a thousand dollars of gross. So he'd make 500 bucks or 550, or whatever that is, his cut of that. And he would be, he'd do that 7 a.m. to 9 a.m. And then he'd be out. He'd be done for the day. He'd go golf or do whatever he did. So there's all kinds of gross stories like that for sure. It took me the first five years when I left Wall Street, I basically invited six clients to come with me in 2001 when I started my own company. And I asked them what they wanted. And they said, hey, less product, more education, less sales, more planning. And so I was like, all right, we can do education and planning. And that's been the pillar of everything I've done for ever since 20, 22 years, 23 years. Yeah. Thanks for that perspective. I think people see think movies like the Wolf of Wall Street and they're like, is it really like that? Yeah. And you're like, I've had yeah. a bit of examples of that as well in the little that I've spent there. And I'm like, yeah, there's some of that, probably more of that happening than they let on as well. Yeah. So I'd love for you to share a bit more about the drive for this in your relationship with your brother. You've shared this story on the, your podcast as well. I know it's a tough subject, but I think for some context, I really resonate with the mission mm -hmm. that you had and that you started with your brother. So I'd love to share a little bit of that with the listeners. So in, I think it was 2012, my brother and I started a separate company called Workers Financial. And we were going to basically, it was registered in the state of California. We were going to try to build tools for, and, and educational tools and other things for people that were just kicking off, just starting their financial journey, you know, needed to learn something, needed to get savings going you know, maybe needed to borrow a little bit for a down payment house, whatever. So we wanted to teach people how to do that and then provide them support and coaching and stuff to, along, to go along with that. Our model was more of nonprofit or a co-op model. We weren't trying to make this to be some massive thing that we're going to make a bunch of money. And between 2012 and today, venture capital has funded everything under the sun for the same thing, like for the same target. We weren't trying to be venture capital. We weren't trying to do that. We're trying to do something that's just purely good for people. And we went along this path for a while, but at the time we had long, we had young kids, we couldn't really dedicate the time that was required. So we ended up closing that, I think four years later. And then in about 2019, 2020, we started talking about, Hey, my company has grown. I don't want to run the business piece of anymore. I want you to come on and be my CEO and I can just focus on content creation, on helping people and doing this stuff. And you can help me distribute that content and get out into the world with it. And He's got an MBA from Cal. He was, he was super sharp, great kid, great guy. We had it all lined up January, 2022. He's going to join the firm and we're going to change the world of personal finance in June 15th. No day before June 17th of 2021, he drowned in the Pacific ocean. And obviously that throws all the plans go away. My own ability to function as a business owner kind of declined quickly. I could probably do it now, but I really don't want to do it. So by the end of the year, 2021, I had merged the wealth management portion of my firm into a larger firm, EP Wealth. And I'm happy to be there. I'm happy to be part of the team. And I kept Mindful Money as a coaching platform, as an education platform, so I could pursue the mission that Dave and I had together. Now, I don't have the same technology, and you know this, like I don't have the same 
technical skills that he had. I don't know how Facebook works. I don't know how marketing works on these things. I just, I don't know any of this stuff, but I know the message. So after I merged the firm, I talked to a couple of different people. I ended up starting my podcast a year, about a year later with you. And I so much appreciate the help and everything you guys have given. I started writing. I have this weekly newsletter I've been doing for 15 years. For the first early years, it was pretty canned. And I started writing all of that myself. I published my first book and my second book. I'm working on the third book and I've got the fourth and the fifth lined up already. So basically I'm trying to create information, education, and really psychological support for people to get to better outcomes without needing to have a million dollars to start, like without needing to qualify for advisors or advice. And so we've had coaching programs, we've got a boot camp, we've got all that kind of stuff for that. But it's really, how do I take this thing that my brother and I want to do together without the technical skill set and get it in front of more people and really help people Thanks out. Thanks for sharing that story. I know we probably shared it a couple of times, maybe more since on other shows and I know it through the podcast, but I, it's helpful, I think, to provide some context in terms of you talk about the mission and, and even talking about your back history, about how you're wanting to help people, because it does, you know, having been through that system, the banking system, the money system, it's really foreign to so many people and they feel like it's out of their reach. It's not something, that's something the, the wealthy people do, or that's something rich people do. And not coming, growing up myself as not having th those opportunities, you know, you feel awkward in situations where that's being discussed or the little people tell you about savings or you feel like, what am I going to save if I don't even have enough coming in? And you talk about this psychological support that, which you specifically mentioned. Why use that phrase? I'm curious about that because is it really a mix of not just the actual book smarts to do what needs to get done? I'm curious why there's a, why you consider there's a psychological aspect to it as well. I mean, finance is interesting because finance is like, it's the one thing that I know of where the smarter person doesn't win. Like just knowing more about how to invest does not mean you're a success, a more successful investor. I know everything. Like I've read all the books. I've read the academic studies. I've read, but that doesn't give me any insight into what happens next. Because investing is 100%. It's forward-looking. It requires us to either know something about the future, which is impossible, which nobody knows anything about the future. There are no facts about the future. I don't want the next pandemic hits. I don't know if we're going to have a world war. I don't know who's going to be like the president. I can't know any of these things. So I can't really make investment policy out of chaos theory. I can't do that. So what can I do? Well, oddly, there's a ton of academic research that tells us what we should do. And it's very clear. It's not complex. You do very simple things. There's three things. There's only three things that actually lead to great financial outcomes, right? One, you got you already touched on this one. You got to earn some money. You have to earn money. You have to invest as much of the money that you earn as possible. You have to invest as much money there as you earn as possible in equities, in equity, whether it's your own business or a real estate or mm -hmm. whatever, in ownership. That's it. Those are the three things. The first part, earning, that's, I've got to become better. I've got to be a better employee. I've got to earn the raise. I've got to deserve a higher income. I've got to hustle to create a second income. I got to, that's something that, that's some intellect, but it's mostly psychology and action, right? The idea of saving or investing a percentage, that's also a choice. People say, oh, I don't make enough. I can't save. Listen, I know people that come into this country for the first time. They live eight people to a room so that they can save. And a guy, an Uber driver, picked me up from the airport in New York and drive me to my hotel. And he said, we had this great conversation. It's a 30 minute drive. And he was like, yeah, I got to get the car back to my cousin. My cousin's going to take the car. He's got the next Uber shift. And I'm like, oh, your cousin, you live in the same place? Yeah, we all live in the same place. There's six of us. We live in the same room. I live with, in my uncle's house. There's 12 people in the place. It's a two bedroom place. We're saving money so that I can get another car. So we have another Uber driver that's all the time. We're starting another business. Da, 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 da. You make choices that enable you to save and invest in something. And that's, yeah, I feel for people that don't feel like they have a choice, but they have a choice. Right? They have a choice. It can be hard, but there's a choice. That's psychology. And then the last thing is, is that I've written about this for the last two months on a very steady clip every single week, like 10 pages a week. It's been, I've gotten more feedback on this writing than I've ever gotten. I'm finally kind of coming into my own and being honest about this. 
I love equities. I'm a zealot. There is no better passive investment on earth. And people are afraid of them and they're worried about the volatility. And that all becomes, that's all psychology. Because if you look back at any 20-year period, the worst 20-year period in the last 100 years is a 6% positive return, right? Yeah. But if you look at it day to day, ooh, you know, any day I might lose 4%. You know, I could lose 6% tomorrow. I could lose 40, 50% next year. But the average annual return over that 20-year worst period is 6% average annual. So, I mean, it's just you get bogged down in the details and you get worried about the current gathering darkness and the news headlines. And it just, that's psychology. So by introducing psychology and by, and this is where that mindfulness comes in, the fear of the thing that might happen or the fear that's expressed in the headlines, which by the way, those headlines are intentionally designed to be create fear. That's how they write the headlines. How do I make people more Perfect. afraid so they click on my stuff more often? That's what that's about. So if you get over the psychology and your mindfulness can keep you from making bad choices, then I can do lots of good that way. And I don't have to do it one-on-one. -on -one. I can do lots of good for lots of people in a group setting because we're not talking about your finances. We're talking about psychology. Yeah. Our I think psychology. what's been interesting for me is also seeing some of the, your recent writings. And you did mention that something that's changed for you recently. And, and most people think, well, I'm a podcaster. I started podcasting because I didn't really like writing, you know, back in 2014. I thought I'm just going to talk because there's writers that write. I just like, you know, talking and getting my conversation from other people. So, I mean, a big part of what I do is feeding off the, my guests as well. But I've noticed recently myself, I'm trying to be consistent with my Saturday newsletter as well. How have you seen that that shift has either complemented what you're doing from the podcast perspective or helped you have this more long form way to teach the things, you know, you talked about the coming dark, the series is called the, the gathering darkness, the gathering darkness. So gathering how has that darkness. opened up for you? This, you know, this ability to, kind of, to, in your mind, I think how you put it was like, speak what you've been meaning to say, or what's been in your heart for a long time. Actually. So I've been writing every day for 20 years. Like I mm -hmm. can't help, but write. it is how I think. And so part of it is maybe in the last couple of months, I've clarified my thinking like, and so I've been able to. And the comments I'm getting are, Jonathan, I've never heard it put this way. This makes so much sense. I can now engage equities more easily. And that's heartening. That makes me feel good. And that's what I want to do. So I'm taking, I'm trying to take those last eight weeks and package them in a different way. Cause huge positive response from the public, from my clients, from the subscribers of the newsletter. Obviously that does great work. I've been trying to do this. I've been saying the same thing for 25 years. Yeah. But I get response for this. So this needs to be the core of something. So I got to, maybe it's the next book. I don't know what it's going to be. But there's a lot of stuff there. Yeah, just, I've been very successful for 25 years, basically focusing on, I've tried every kind of investment known to man, but the one that's worked consistently throughout every cycle mm -hmm. is owning great companies. I'm just trying to help people own great companies. You can be the brand new investor. You can have a hundred dollars and you can own great companies with that hundred dollars, but you got to commit to it. You got to hold it. You got to stick with it. When you have another hundred bucks, you got to add to it. This is how this works. That's how you- And I was going to ask my next question. Like what, you know, when people are just getting started, they always feel like, I don't have enough. I don't have a thousand dollars. I don't have $10,000. But I think what you just said is if it's really the mindset to decide that this is the path you want to take. And then to start, it sounds like you can start with a hundred dollars or $500. And obviously it's not going to be a ton of companies, but maybe, and we'll provide the links to your program. So if maybe you could talk a little bit about that, because I want people to know that something that I'm actually considering joining myself for the record, because I've been just reading the notes over the past couple of weeks. I'm like, I should probably be in this, but talk a little bit about what you're putting together to make it more accessible. Yeah. So I would actually come January, this is going to, anyone in a content creation world, we iterate, like we have to iterate and figure it out. Right. So we're actually shifting January, maybe February to, it's going to be hundred percent membership based. And all the stuff that I do is going to go into the membership. And really the question is going to be, if you're a full member, there's going to be three tiers. The largest tier is going to also have an, an hour conversation with me one-on-one. -on -one. The middle tier is you're going to have access to everything in the live group. The lowest tier is going to have everything from video. Really, it's the same information. It's just going to be which package do you get? You had an original part of the question. Just I want talk to answer, a little bit about how you know, people think this is only accessible to people who can work with a financial professional. Yeah. So just, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, the basic, simple rules are just so easy to do. And so there's, I can do, and I have clients that have done really, really, really deep forensic, you know, financial planning, where we look at every single detail in their lives. And 
when I look at all those that I've done, you can pull out, there's like seven main things that you do. And there's sort of an order of operations to finance. You know, first you, you get out of your high interest debt, then you build your emergency fund. Then you start saving in your retirement program. Then you maybe save either more in the retirement program or you pay off your low interest debt, right? So there's really some very basic, simple step-by-step -step processes you can apply. That means you don't have to do a very, very deep financial plan. And most people don't really need, our financial lives are very similar. Like in reality, if you've got a job and you get a paycheck, that paycheck has to go to pay for some stuff that you spend money on, your rent, your food, your cell phone plan, your car, right? And then you got some left over. Well, we got to flip that. Maybe we should save some first, right? And then spend the stuff on the other things. Maybe you should know what you should need to save. So that requires a small calculation, but that I have a simple spreadsheet that I share with people on how they can do that themselves. So it can be really simple for the basics. And I would guess 90% of people, mm -hmm. it's just the basics. It really, it's just the basics. The thing, and this is Vanguard's research says this, Morningstar's research says this, and this is, we do this once a month. The thing that an advisor the largest benefit that the advisor provides is behavioral support. That's the psychology. So once a month, we have a session, we call it ignore the noise and I'll present the current noise. This is what people are saying in the media. This is why that probably doesn't matter in the long term. This is why they're presenting it, right? The new data came out and this is what it is. And they can get you to pull this lever and, and maybe change to their portfolio and maybe, you know, get worried about stuff. So we talk about everything once a month. And then when the world goes haywire, which it hasn't in the last you know, six, eight months, but when it goes haywire, we have some special sessions. I'll touch on those things, right? They'll say, hey, let's do this on next Thursday at four o'clock. We're going to have this conversation because people are scared. The point of that isn't that we're going to do anything differently. The point of that is to mm -hmm. provide some calm and to move people out of the amygdala fight or flight response into the frontal cortex, have them think about it, reflect on their plan realize that, hey, probably the best thing I can do for myself is sit on my hands right now, not do anything. Ride this out. This too shall pass. The world tells us this time is different. We respond with, nah, this too shall pass. And that we do that over and over and over and over again. Because it's like vitamin C. Like we need a vitamin C every day, but every day we need more vitamin yeah. C. We pee it out. It doesn't stay. So we have to, we need yeah. more vitamin C. So this is that. This is Financial psychology is the vitamin C for our wealth development. You might have just titled this episode, thanks. <laughs> that's, that's great. Yeah, thanks for sharing that. We'll make sure for the listener, for the viewer, that we have the link for that program in the show notes as well, because I think it's, it's highly valuable. So shifting over to the world of podcasting, I know you talked about us getting started working together. I'm wondering if you can think back to that first nudge that you felt. Were you listening to them? Were you watching them videos? Or, you know, or did you just feel this? pull to like, I got something to say, and I think it's about time. So my development to podcasting was sort of three steps. The first step was I published my first book. And so my publisher said, Hey, we should get on as many podcasts as we can yeah. be on. This was 2017. We should get on as many podcasts as we can. And I was on like a hundred podcasts in maybe 110 podcasts in a year, which was super fun. I just talking to people and had a great time. One of the women whose podcast I was on, she runs a real estate podcast yeah. in Canada. Montreal. And she invited me to, she said, she called me afterwards and said, Hey, we should do a podcast together. And I was like, Oh, you know, that's kind of scary. I don't really know how to do that. And so I started doing it with her a little bit. And this was the mindful wealth podcast. We were sort of commenting on the place of wealth in our culture. Like what is, I mean, there's a lot of weight. There's a lot of fear. There's a lot of anger. We had academics on. We talked about all kinds of stuff. It was a super fun podcast, which by the way, we're, we're trying to bring back. Hopefully we bring it back in 2024, but it was kind of slow moving. It wasn't specific to the thing I wanted to do with the audience for education wise. It was very big picture. It wasn't granular enough. It wasn't decisions on the ground. How can I help people? It was like, how can I help society? But I, I don't have any pull there. Like I can't really change society. I can change things for one person one at a time. So I said, Hey, I need to do this other thing. And then I just started researching because you know me, like who can handle the technology? Cause I can't handle the technology. I can talk to people. I love talking to people, but I can't do any of the tech stuff. So I started looking at people and I, I found you guys and podcast junkies yeah. and, and I was like, Hey, how do we do this? So, so uh, you know, we set up. I know in the beginning, you know, we were talking about getting set up with your first guests and there, you had a, a dream list, you know, dream 100 or whatever, where is that list of people you want to speak to? And there's some heavy hitters or people that you admired in the space. And I'm 
I imagine, I think we talked about it a little bit, like a little bit of apprehension, like, oh, I'm going to have this call schedule with this guy and I really admire him. And I'm curious, those first interviews, if you could talk a little bit about what you were feeling going in and then once you had it and once you saw what the flow was like and that, you know, you got a couple of them recorded, did you notice a shift in how you were feeling as a first time host? So I kind of, I mean, my first guest was probably the heaviest hitter guest I've had yeah. to date. Like I went straight for the, and I used the story. Like the point of this podcast is to help people out in the way that my brother and I would have been yeah. helping people together without my brother. And he was like, yeah, let's do this. And we had this great conversation and I've been reading his stuff and listening to him for, I don't know, 30 years. And so he, he's like a guru to me. And so I was really happy to have him on and he was totally gracious. He actually said he'd come on again. So yeah, I'll definitely, he was awesome. But then I kind of went, you know, I was like, oh, that was kind of nerve wracking. So I went kind of to some local people, some people I knew, some people yeah. that would definitely say yes. And I have found, I was always worried about getting the next guest and occasionally you don't have enough in the can. So you're like, I got to get someone on here. Right. Yeah. So I so now I have a process. Like every other Monday I'm, I send up five invites and usually I get one or two people respond, you know, so it's like a pretty consistent process now. But once you build a process around it, I can talk to anybody. Like I can talk to Biden if you'd be on there and it would be fine with yeah. me. Like I wouldn't be afraid of that. Like I can talk to anybody, ask them questions, do a little bit of research, figure out two or three really good topics that we could dig into. And the conversation just happens because just like you, I'm a conversation. I like having conversations. You mentioned the hundreds of shows you'd been on as a guest. How did the dynamic change when you're on the other side of the microphone as the host? Because you have to control the conversation, right? I'm conscious of it always when I'm speaking to people and I'm making sure we're having a flow. There's no awkward breaks, that I'm having follow-up questions ready, that I'm staying connected. I'm maintaining that sense of curiosity, but it's an active thing that I'm doing as a host. And I notice it when I'm a guest, I'm more relaxed. But also the host mindset, I'm just like, you could have asked a follow-up question or you could, there's a little bit of silence here. Like, should I jump in? And it's like, I don't want to take over someone's show. So I'm curious how you've started to develop that skill as a host, which is a, a bit different than just showing up as a guest on a show. I think the hardest thing is as a guest, you're supposed to talk. Like you're supposed to offer complete answers and you're supposed to be the, I mean, you ask yeah. good questions and I answer those questions, but usually I don't know what the percentage is, but 75, 80% yeah, yeah. of the talking is from the guest, right? So the, the shift as a host is shutting up. That's the hardest part, right? The hardest part is not driving the conversation yeah. in time. For me, that's the hardest part is not driving the conversation is asking a question and then teasing out more answer. And they, they close and you're like, okay, well, what, let's a little bit deeper on that. What about this element of that? Or what'd your dad say about that? Or that, 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 that. I just tease out a little bit more and just get them to keep talking. But usually, you know, most yeah. people like to talk, so it's not that much of a problem. Shutting up is hard. Yeah, you can see it. And I referenced it from an editing perspective back in the day. You would see the two files. You see the host, and you see the guest, and you see the WAV file. And when the WAV file of the host is bigger than the WAV file of the guest, you already know, like, the host is talking too much. You can see it, the visual representation. <laughs> yeah. And it's to your point, being comfortable with silence, I think, has been a big one. Because you just, you want to yeah. jump in, and you feel like there's an awkward moment. And video has made this easier. Is you can see people's reaction. You can see they got their finger to their head. They're looking up. They're like thinking about, should I give them the politically correct answer? Or should I give them the answer from the heart? And I think what I've found is that ability to break the ice in that first five to 10, 15 minutes is really crucial because as you progress through the conversation, you'll want to probe a little deeper. And I think it's surprising to see how much of a connection you can build with someone in, in an hour long conversation. But if, if done correctly, you know, I, what I've discovered is that you can get people to open up and I think most people are just dying for like good conversation and trying to connect and they want to share their story and they have a voice inside them that needs to be heard. And I think it's a skill when I've seen it done well, that a host can bring that out gradually in a safe way for their guests. Yeah. I think that I get better yeah. at it with every episode. I think in the very yeah. beginning, I didn't know what I was doing, yeah. which is, you know, I think that's fine. Like this is the whole thing we become, like we have to be willing to let go of our old mm. selves to create our new selves. That's how we learn. That's how we get better. So I think I'm approaching a hundred episodes. So by my 500th episode, I'll be good. Yeah. I, you, still have you refined your dream list now? Do you have a, a couple of new names on there? Oh yeah. Yeah. I have a bunch of names on there and they will respond to me, but they, yeah. Won't, yeah. they won't say yes just yet, but I will. Yeah. I've heard it from some, some hosts sure. when they start, you know, swinging for the, the bigger names, there's probably five to 10, 20 different, like either no answers or rejections, but there you can see and yeah, people describe it like, yeah, you just have to be persistent. 
and continue asking and it could be a couple of years, but eventually, you know, the, your show will grow, your visibility will grow and they'll be like, oh yes. And then you'll send back that original message from three years ago. Like, yes, <laughs> this is what I originally asked you. So thanks for coming on right now. Yep. So. And, but you do notice it as a host. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm curious, like that you've gotten better and more comfortable in your skin as you're having these conversations. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I still prepare yeah. for every single one. Like I still, you know, I read the book or I look up the person's, what they're doing. I see some of the other interviews yeah. they've been on and I do this for every interview and I want to do this for every interview because I want to make sure that every, I want to be in the space mm -hmm. that they're most comfortable playing in. I don't want to yeah. ask them any zingers and occasionally I still ask them a zinger. Occasionally I'll be like, wow, that seems, I was on with Spencer Sherman recently and he said something that I was I was like, no, I don't think you're right on that. <laughs> I was like, no, no, I think there are people that could reasonably give up an eye for a billion dollars. Like, I think that's, I don't, you know, I think I would, I would be one of the ones. He was like, yeah. no one would ever do that. I'm like, no, yeah, you know, there's a price for an eye. Like, I think that people would. Anyway, yeah. that was a no, but I think it's just thought. a function of being comfortable in your own skin and being comfortable that you are directing the conversation. And that you're controlling the flow of it. And that's the responsibility that you have to your audience and to your listeners, because they're counting on you to share, bring in these guests that they don't have, that they wouldn't have had access to, but also they're coming in for your insight. And what's your take on this guest? And what can you get out of this guest? And, and I think that's fascinating to always think about. I always keep harping on about the three people in the conversation, the host, the guest, and the listener. And, you know, try not to lose sight of that because without them, we don't have a shit up. That's right. I have a couple of questions that I always ask my guests as we get close to the end. The first is, what's something that you've changed your mind about recently? There's always a nice little pause when I ask that same question. The thing I've changed my mind about recently, I'm trying to go back. It's interesting because it's, there's the big things and I, I want to actually come up with a big thing that I've changed my mind about recently, but there isn't really yeah. a big thing. It's little things it's like, so this maybe gets into things. So my brother died two years ago. So for all the holidays for the last couple of years, we've hosted at our house mm -hmm. and we've invited his family to come to the house. And this year, for the first time, I'm like, you know what, Judy, how about, how about you host this year? We'll help. We'll be there, whatever. But let's mm -hmm. bring some cheer to your house. Let's not have it all at our house. Let's go to your house. And, you know, she said, yeah, let's do it. So I was like, all right, cool. We'll make it as easy as possible for you. Like, we'll be there. My parents will be there. So we'll make it as easy as possible. But not just always solving the problem and not just always just allowing allowing some of the joy to go that way. That prompts another question for me. What sources do you draw from to have this, what I sense is like this sense of that there's goodness in the world and this, that there's people that need, always need support and feel like you always do whatever you have in your capacity to do to help people whenever you see that there's an ability to do so. And, and sometimes, you know, we all are going through our own personal challenges as well. So I'm curious if anything comes up for you when I ask, you know, where do you draw from to get that strength, to, to make those calls and to provide that energy? Because it requires some more of you, you know, and you may be going through your own things as well. So I'm curious what resonates for you when you think about that. Well, so my, for, I've lived an incredibly blessed life. I've always been super optimistic. My dad was super optimistic. I used to, a client would lose a loved one. And, you know, I did all the things that would be supportive of the client who lost a loved one, you know, the flowers and send an email and send them a text and send them just love on them a little bit. Right. And then I lost a loved one and no texts or flowers or anything changes anything about that. They're all nice gestures. They're all beautiful things. I had one client and this is two or two, we're two and a half years later. I have one client who for like the first seven or eight months would send me, she walks her dog around Berkeley and she would send me a photo of something that looks like a heart with her dog sitting next to it every day, every other day for months and months and months and months. And then it was, you know, it became every two days and it became every three days. It was once a week. I just, yesterday I got another one, like two and a half years later. So this is someone who's, is going through her own family struggles. She's got her own stuff. And she said, right out of the gate, you don't have to respond to any of these. I'm just showing you love. Like I'm just showing you that people are here and they care about you, which I just, I can get through a conversation about losing my brother. But when I think about that, I'm like, that is amazing. So I think she draws on not a religious background, but she just draws on this 
the desire to be a good neighbor, the desire to be a good person. I think my dad and my mom really said, you got to be a good person. And I got that, you know, I was raised Christian and I went to church and I wouldn't call myself Christian. I mean, I've been baptized and all that kind of stuff, catechism. But what I learned was you got to love your neighbor, Hmm. right? You got to be vulnerable to difficulty. And I didn't really understand that until I lost my brother. And so I was always very optimistic and very positive and very upbeat. And I could step out. I was a guy that helped that I could do all these things, but I had, I never needed help and I didn't want help and I didn't want to until I lost my brother. And then I learned the other side and it took me probably six weeks to actually say to somebody, I need help. Like, I'm really not going to, I cannot do this myself. And in doing that, I got help and, and I saw the benefits of that. And so now I kind of draw from history of optimism and I draw from you know, the experience of needing and just, if I can do something to help, I'll help. Like that's, and the experience of those people who stepped up, I had a buddy who met me outside my front door every day for, I don't know, three or four months. And we just went for a walk in the park together, like 6 a.m., dark, cold, 6 a.m. walk every single day because he had to go to work, right? And I had to go to work. So, and people step up. And so I want to, I don't ever want to not be that person. I want to step up. And I have never done as awesome things as they've done. Like I'm, I'm there. I can be helpful. I want to help people, but people have shown me the way. So I try to be better. That's incredibly inspiring. Thank you for sharing that. I'm glad I asked. What is the most misunderstood thing about you? So I'm six foot five. I weigh 220. I'm strong. I'm fast. I'm athletic. I seem to be pretty outgoing and gregarious. I'm not. (laughs) I'm a very sensitive, vulnerable, easily affected person. And sometimes, yeah, I wear my heart on my sleeve and it gets crushed. Like it does. And that's, you look at me and, and people don't think that, but yeah, that's the thing that people miss. And I think it's a thing that a lot of people miss in their outward perception of others. And I'm, I feel like I'm a similar soul <laughs> because of it. I'm sen- sensitive to a fault sometimes. I'm like a little too much. And you know, my partner keeps me in check and she's like, you know, we got to balance this out a little bit. So, but it's, I think about everything that's conditioned me, family stuff, life stuff, you know, everything that's got me to this point now. So, and I don't want to be defined by my past. And so I'm glad you share that because I think it's also a reminder that we can be that way, but also we can also function in this world in a way that allows us to contribute the best of our abilities to make the world a better place. So I appreciate sharing that. Yes. Someone said, uh, I don't know who, this is a quote I hear all the time, but it's so true. It's like, be yourself. Everyone else is already taken, right? It's be your authentic, true self. I can't imagine how awful would it be to pretend you were somebody else, pretend you wanted other things, and then be really, really successful at that. That would suck. Like you would end up, I would rather be myself and have it my own skin, be honest, be authentic and fail than try to be something I'm not and get really successful. Like I just can't think that that would be fun. Doesn't sound miserable. (laughs) Oh, that's right. (laughs) Well, John, thank you so much. I was really looking forward to this conversation, just, you know, from watching your journey and you evolve as a podcaster, podcast host, and seeing how much excitement you get from having these conversations and, you know, building these connections with your guests, closing in on a hundred is no small feat. So I just want to publicly thank you for being consistent because that's the biggest challenge. You know, people, they, they call it the pod fade, you know, you get to seven, you're like, whoa, this is like a bit more than I expected. And I think it's getting over that hump and then seeing and having that vision to see that you are making a change because people are hearing you directly talk about the things that you're passionate about. And that resonates with people. And I think I imagine it's something, some of what you're experiencing by having these conversations, the feedback you're getting, not only from the newsletter, but from the podcast itself and even from your guests. So again, I applaud you for your consistency. I'm I'm looking forward to your hundredth and your 500th (laughs) after that, because I think you'll see just how that journey evolves is really exciting. So I appreciate you for being vulnerable too, for sharing your story. I know some of sometimes it's challenging, but I think it's helpful for the audience to hear different perspectives and, and also a reminder that we're all on similar paths and we're going through similar challenges of different varieties. But I think conversations like this are important for people to hear and be inspired by. Yeah. Harry, thanks for having me on it. I always love having a conversation with you. It's been great. Where's the best place for folks to connect with you? 
mindful.money. All the socials are there. You know, it's, there's no.com. It's just mindful.money. Yep. Okay. We'll make sure we have all those links and the program you mentioned in the show notes as well, for people can learn more. Thanks again, Jonathan. We really appreciate it. Thanks, Harry.